Hospital Porter's Pride and Dignity, Stop the New World Order. Welcome to Her Panwo TV and welcome to this video, which is not about UFOs. I thought after the last few, you might like a change. So yeah, we're talking psychics and mediums and ghosties and things like that this evening. Yes, we are. Now, uh, what you see behind me in this particular um, background is courtroom number four at the Old Bailey. Yes, and um, well, and just, just to my... As you can see, just, just over this shoulder here, you can see this oh, this shoulder, you can see the dock. Now, um, someone was sitting in there um, 89 years ago. Right. Who am I talking about? Well, you probably guessed I'm talking about Helen Duncan. I'm doing another video about Helen Duncan. If you go to the show notes, it's, it's very important if you go to the description box, actually, because I'm not going to go into all the background of what this subject is, because it's just too much. There's too much material. But I have a portal called the Helen Duncan portal, which you'll see in the description box. There's a link there. and Everything you need to know about the background to this case is there. If I don't do that, I'll just end up repeating myself endlessly whenever I make a new video. And this video will be five hours long. Um, the reason I'm um, the reason I'm uh, I brought this subject up is actually for a very, very different something very different. It, it is actually to address um, another YouTube user, another content creator, who has made a video about Helen Duncan, and so I, th um, I thought I would make a video in response to this person because, basically, this person has got a lot wrong. And uh, you know, when I make response videos, it's always because I'm criticising someone or correcting them in their mistakes. <clears throat> so that's why I'm doing it now. The person I'm talking about is actually a, a chap called. Count Dankula. He goes by the username Count Dankula, and he's uh, very, very uh, well known. He's a very successful content creator, and he's actually quite famous, or should I, should I say, infamous? He had like 15 minutes of infamy a couple of years ago because he uh, was arrested. This is this is a bit crazy. Uh, the the chap's name is is Mark Meekin. Um, he's uh, a guy from Scotland, and. Um, he made a he, he got he really got hounded in the press because he made a video which i can't even describe on youtube but it, it was a video which i think is, is actually very funny um mark meekin is actually a comedian he's a comedian and uh, his as well as a, a youtuber and um it's it's easy i can understand why some people found it offensive but you see sometimes things are offensive because they're funny and funny because they're offensive you see what I mean? Unfortunately, comedy is about that. And in fact, this 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 ignited a whole debate about free speech because um, Mark Meekin was arrested and he was convicted under the Communications Act of 2003 Scotland. And um, he was fined £800. Now, um, he refused to pay the fine. He's, he donated £800 to the Glasgow Children's Hospital. Um, and eventually they, they, they had an investment of wages order and they seized the money from him plus costs. But um, yeah, Mark Meekin is um, has appeared on her Panwo TV before. On, on and now, um, you remember I went on this. I went on something called Day for Freedom. It's I'll, I'll put a link in the description box to that as well. It's actually a really good video which I really enjoyed making. It was a very very good event. I went to a street protest in London, and um, I'll I'll just play you a little bit of where he actually appears in the in the actual video. Here he is. This is a Day for Freedom, which I made four years ago. <laughs> Just got to have right there. Oh, you've got it's Meekin, but for the people that don't know me, I go by Count Dankula online. <laughs> Over two years ago, I decided to pay a plank on my girlfriend. She thinks her pet pug is the cutest thing on earth. That's him. Just, I need to show you a little bit of that. You can go and watch the rest of the video if you want, but that's Count Dankula. But anyway, Count Dankula has made a video about Helen Duncan. Now, um, and I'm going to uh, just review that video now. Um, now, I, I, was, I wasn't sure exactly how to do this. I have left a link in the description box to the link to the original video that he made. I have um, edited it slightly. I mean, I want, this is always a bit tricky, you know, because it, going through, because I'm faced with a bit of a dilemma do I like do a extended highlights version like I do for Christy Winters and Kevin Logan when I'm re when I'm sort of like re reviewing them or Stefan Molyneux when I'm reviewing them doing reply videos? Um, alternatively, I can you know, if I do that. If I do that, people may accuse me of um, people may accuse me of editing Count Dankula unfairly. 
they may say I'm trying to distort his message. That's not my intention. That's, it's simply for brevity, for the sake of brevity. Alternatively, if, if I don't do that, people might accuse me of, of breaching his copyright. Now, um, as, as you saw in the titles, this I have put a, a copyright disclaimer on this. I believe what I'm doing is fair use. I am actually going to show you almost all of this video. I have deleted a couple of little segments which I think are irrelevant. But I'm going to show you all the subject, the matter, all the, the all the parts of this video which deal with the subject matter of Helen Duncan. All right, and um, he, I mean, Helen Duncan, of course, is uh, was a psychic medium. Just to give you a bit of basics, like I said, all the rest is in my portal in the description box. Helen Duncan was a psychic medium, very powerful one, born in 1898 in Calendar, Perthshire, Scotland. And um, she was actually arrested and convicted under the Witchcraft Act of 1735 in 1944. And um, we're going to kind of go into that. I mean, I'll go into that in great detail in several live lectures I've done, studio videos, stuff like that. And a tour. I visit the tour of the locations, um, including the Old Bailey. Although in that video, I don't actually film inside. You can't actually film inside courtrooms unless you're taking official photos like this. All right, so with no further ado, I will uh, just uh, bring Count Dankula onto the show here i'll just whoops i'll just open his video here we go leave the version that i've got here now this is a video called as the five of absolute mad lads helen duncan and um he has this series called absolute mad lads where he he does a profile of, of someone he considers especially eccentric and wild and and um charismatic and um, he's chosen Helen Duncan. Of course, in this case, it will be Mad Lasses. But um, he, he's done this video here, which I will show you now. Here we go. I don't know how many you can see now. I'll just, um, I'm not going to have it on full screen, but I want you to see on most of this. That's, that's Count Dankula. That's the guy himself. So, uh, yeah, I think you can see that. Here we go. You that actually I'll go back to the the, beginning. There we as go. the five of you that actually watch the Celtic Myths videos will know, there is no shortage of superstition in Scotland. And when you're dealing with a culture that believes in wacky stuff like furries that enjoy fishing or nocturnal little dudes that do your chores, it shouldn't come as a surprise. <laughs> I wish I wish they would. I must say I do like Count Dankula. I think he's cool. Um he's very funny. He's he's very likable. He's um He's got a great sense of humor, a very outgoing kind of chap. And um, he's, I think he's got a lot of uh, moral courage, not not just over the issue, not just for resisting the courts when he was quite wrong, quite wrongly and unfairly prosecuted. Um, but he also, he, he was, he's run for office a couple of times on a libertarian ticket. He, um, he was part of this movement in the, in the, um, sort of online excrement lordosphere a few years ago i don't know if you remember that says a load of them joined ukip and he, he was described as a soft coup um, a, um sargon of a cad did it was sargon of a cad paul joseph watson count dankley and lots of their followers all joined ukip and they kind of took it up unfortunately they, it's it actually was um it was all it was kind of a typical internet romp but and uh, Jared Batten, the leader, didn't really see it coming. But unfortunately, you know, people like Sargon have way too much baggage to ever get into serious politics. But they did run for the European Parliament, and uh, Dank, Dank was one of them. So I'm, I'm not having to go. I'm not sort of denigrating Dank as a person. I'm a big Dank fan. Um, he also he says some he says some things about Helen Duncan. I would say are rude. However, I'm going to be more lenient to him than I would be to other people simply because. With him, you don't know whether he's just being funny, whether he's, he's just making another risque joke. And it's possible that's all he's doing. He doesn't really mean any serious harm. But he it's obviously has skeptic views. He has he is very much a skeptic, and that's really the purpose of me making this video. It's, it's not to attack him, it's to correct him. Is that there are those <laughs> of us out there that believe in ghosts. But oh yeah. Well, it's not belief, it's it's about evidence. I know he's not gonna agree with me, but it is about it, it, there is a it's a scientific uh, study but ghosts need a little bit of help on their way through to this mortal plane right <laughs> that's uh, that's an interesting way of putting it but yeah it's uh, it, that's what mediums are is where mediums come in they act like middlemen between our world and the afterlife i guess so i guess that's what they are yeah 
They say that dead men can't talk, and many people are. Well, they can though. It's the problem. This is this is what got Helen Duncan into trouble. In one case, there was about 170 dead men who may well have talked in 1944. Um, it's it, I go into details about it in my various lectures on Helen Duncan. Killed to keep their secrets safe. So you can imagine the trouble that it would cause when ghosts start blotting out military secrets during the bloodiest conflict in history. Well, exactly. How do you... You know, we, we, he's right. I mean, the many people have been killed for the purpose of silencing them. You know, we had to kill him because he knew too much. But, you know, what do you do when you can't silence someone even by killing them? It's In the case of Helen Duncan, as I explained... Um, they were particularly worried about an accident which happened in, in late 1943 when one of the one of the uh, infantry landing boats, which you may be familiar with from war movies, the ones with the ramp at the front, uh, they were one of them sank off the coast of Somerset during an exercise, and uh, everyone on board drowned. And the thing is, that was when they were training for D-Day, and the, the guys on the boat knew when they what knew all the secrets of D-Day. <laughs> yeah. As well as how far the government is willing to go to stop the medium that's making all of this information yeah. public. We, of course, know that mediums are a lot of nonsense. Well, you may think you know that, uh, Dank, but it's not true. I mean, yeah, I mean, there's fraud. Like, there is in all elements of life, but there is a serious side to it. There is, as, as I've explained many times in other videos. Right, they're, they're charlatans. None of it's real. But... Look, just because you've got a beard like James Randi doesn't mean you have to be like him. You're not his reincarnation, mate. <laughs> you're, too, you're too old to be his reincarnation. That doesn't stop them from trying to ply their trade and deceive people. No, well, some of them are trying to help people. Some of them, it's a calling which some of them go with because they to, to bring literally afterlife communication. That's why some of them do it. But sometimes you get mediums who shamelessly take their lies way too far to the point where it just becomes absolutely hilarious. Well, they're not. The thing is, it's not always lies. In the case of Helen Duncan, it's not lies. The last witch in Scotland. It's That's a good... Yeah, I mean, she was often... This is, I think, what made her... I think that's what made her face. She was called that because technically she was the last person to be imprisoned under the Witchcraft Act. She was the second last. I mean, there was contrary to popular belief, there was another conviction after her, but that resu didn't result in an imprisonment. Helen, that was just before it was. It was a repeal in 1951 and replaced with the Fraudulent Mediums Act. After God knows what, over 200 bloody years, when the, the law was hardly used <laughs> for almost a century before they dusted it off. In 1944. Helen Duncan. Yeah. Victoria Helen McRae McFarlane was born in Callander, Perthshire on the 25th of November, 1897. While most mad... You see, that's interesting because there's several... There's Some people said she was born as, as another birthday for her the following year, 1898. Um, I'll have to check that out. Maggie will know um, Helen's granddaughter. Helen, you know, Helen's granddaughter is a friend of mine. Um, she'll know. I'll check with her lads, or in this case mad lassies, tend to grow into their defining traits, Helen had the gift from a very early age and very often drew the ire of her family. And As you recall, like I said, I've mentioned several examples of how as a child she was uh, very, very useful. Although Dank, Dank is going to provide stuff that I didn't know, actually. So he's, I'll let him continue. Those around her by making little predictions that would inexplicably come true. Nothing big like Jotapata will fall on the 47th day or anything like that, but small things that made Helen kind of creepy and earned her the nickname Hellish Nell. It was also her, her legendary her personality. She was quite a hot-headed Scotswoman, you know, and um, that that that's I think the real reason she got her personality. Um, again, Maggie will know these things. Um, Maggie Maggie knows everything about her grandmother. She absolutely um, adores her grandmother, even though she was she was only two years old when when Helen died. But Maggie's always been so close to her grandma and still still has communications with her. Things such as thinking about the number 1066 and then her teacher later having a heart attack as soon as he wrote that number on the blackboard during a history lesson. Or praying for answers that she didn't know during an exam and then the answers appearing in handwriting 
that wasn't hers. Yeah. Helen's family were... That's right. It's, it's legit. She actually did... She actually did... She could put her slate, which is what the kids used to write on in school in those days, under her chair, and it would be filled in. Just a stick of chalk and a slate. Someone would fill it in. So freaked out <coughs> by this that her mother had her tested by a doctor who found nothing. And then... It was useful, though. I mean, Helen also... Do you remember Helen did win the respect of people because some guy went out one late night. It was very cold in winter. It was snowing heavily. And he got lost in a blizzard. And Helen, and a search party went out for him. And Helen guided... She used what we would today call remote viewing to find him before he froze to death. And he survived because of her. She saved his life. Helen told the doctor not to go out that night. Unfazed this by a teenage a girl. Oh, this is this, he's talking about a different sub thing here, a different situation. We're probably talking out of an arse. The doctor did go out that night, and he died in a car accident during a snowstorm. This is not the same incident we're talking about here. Something else didn't reflect well on Helen's family, and it, alongside a lack of local jobs, was part of the reason why they actually kicked Helen out of the house at the age of just sixteen. Since it wasn't a good look in those days for the local minister to be accusing your daughter of consorting with the devil. Despite this treatment... Funny enough, like, they are. I mean, I must say Scotland, I mean, now, Scotland has, has always been a bit of a religiously fanatical place. Not every, not generally, not everywhere, I must say. But certainly in the Highlands, they have the, the Free Church of Scotland. And believers in that can be quite could be quite fire and brimstone. Uh, for example, um, it's some people are blaming the, the you know, Alistair Crowley's house, Beleskin house, has been vandalised by uh, people who like, who support the We Free, and um, they've been in Edinburgh, for example. There's um, there was like a an anti witch pogrom in Edinburgh that was like resulted in like I think half the city being burned at the stake or something ridiculous like that. In sometime in the in the I think it was back in the 11th or 12th century um so scotland is a place of superstition he's right he's he's correct in that sense of course he he and i probably have a different attitude towards superstition i'm uh, i think he's he's regards it all as nonsense i think some of it is logically valid not least as i said before in going back to the whole situation of the paranormal and ufos um Scotland, for for its size, uh, for it's quite a, Scotland's a pretty small country and has a small population. It is the most likely place you will see a UFO. It's more than any other country in the world. Scotland is a UFO hotspot, and I think apart from Cornwall, which is the top, the top uh, place in the world, Scotland is also one of the top places for paranormal phenomena. For cryptozoology, of course, it's got Nessie. It's so yeah, Scotland is an all-round woo-woo place. If you're like a woo-woo crazy tinfoil hatter like me, Scotland is the place to go. And Helen wasn't alone in her voodoo nonsense for very long. Voodoo, <laughs> Vo now voodoo is actually a uh, it's a it's a syncretic shamanic religion from I believe from it originates in West Africa, but it's most famously it most famously exists in Haiti, in the Caribbean. And it's still there. It's still very popular today. Some people claimed it's the it's the shamanic religion most likely to survive into the into the into the future. That's uh, Benedict Allen. I remember um, did this Last of the Medicine Men series, which is very good. But um, Helen Voodoo had had no influence at all, and has had very little influence anywhere apart from in the United States because of Haitian immigrants and things like that. But apart from Holland's voodoo believers certainly didn't get to Scotland and they did not influence the Western spiritual movement, spiritist movement at all. At the age of 20, Helen married a cabinet maker <coughs> named Henry Duncan, who reportedly greeted her by saying... That's the photo taken for the newspapers outside the Old Bailey. There's, there's Henry and Helen walking to, into court, looking very confused and di disturbed about what the, what the hell was going on. No doubt, that's uh, she's got like some papers, some court paperwork there. You know, her um, Lowsby, her solicitor, would have been helping her. He did as much as he could to help her. Um, unfortunately, Lowsby, like I've said before, Lowsby uh, was a bit out of his depth <coughs> in this case. 
saying, so we meet at last when they first met. Because they both claimed to have had visions of each other before crossing paths. Oh, I didn't know that, actually. I didn't know that. Um, that's a new one on me. But, you know, people. some people do. Some people... And I, this has happened to me, actually, when I've met someone for the first time. And I think, don't I know you from somewhere? And you get a kind of deja vu feeling. And sometimes it involves um, automatic feelings of warmth or automatic repulsion. As if that person... I know that person to be a very good person or a very bad person. I didn't get that feeling when I met Sue Stain, um, who Sue Sue Stain is my only the only long term relationship I've ever had. I'm not complaining. I mean, you're lucky to get even that in this day and age. But um, I didn't get that feeling with her when I met her. But it's possible, you know, she it, we have known each other previously. Same with other other individuals. You know, it could be a member of your family. It could be a friend or something like that. Yeah, Henry fully supported Helen's witchy bullshit. Which is just as well. But Witchy bullshit is slightly more accurate than voodoo nonsense. But uh, again, he's, he's a sceptic, obviously, and I'm going to disagree with him. Because he gave her so much ectoplasm that they ended up having six kids that he looked after as a stay-at-home father. Is that some... Is couldn't it, work much. I'm, sure, I'm not sure I get that joke. Maybe I think... Uh, is he using is he using ectoplasm to mean semen? I think that's I think that's what he's saying. But jokes are funnier when I don't explain them, don't I? But she did have an awful she did have a huge number of children. And a lot of people did in those days. And the reason is because if you were poor and you were living like in the in the late nineteenth, early twentieth century, how you could you had to guarantee some of them would survive because unfortunately a lot of them didn't. Much because he suffered from arthritis and a weak heart after being kicked out of the military during World War One. So Helen had to be the one to bring the money in. So she scraped together a living in a bleach factory. However, this was only a part-time job, and Helen spent the rest of her time in the spiritual church seat, where she gained enough clout to become a minister. And, and she earned she earned a healthy living from that. Um, and as I said, I don't think see <clears throat> because I don't believe I don't believe spiritualism is all fake the way that. Dank does, and many, many skeptics do, or all the skeptics do. Because um, I don't believe it's something fake. I don't think it's anything immoral in earning a living from it. And Helen did earn it, did earn her family a healthy living from it. And it was a choice. I mean, for her, either she could do that, or she could her whole family would live in crushing poverty with her husband unable to work and the meager wages from the bleach factory coming in. Um, so she chose to use her talents to earn a living, and good. Good for her, I say, because I believe she was genuine. You see, this is the thing. Dank doesn't, and I do, and that's that's the main difference between us. And it was at this point that Helen found her true calling. With Henry acting as her manager, Helen started carrying out seances in the 1920s, in which she would sit in a cabinet behind a closed curtain, fall into a trance, and call forth the spirits of her bereft customers, recently departed loved ones. Yeah, um, that's a photograph. I don't know. I don't know the, the authenticity of that particular photograph. I don't even know that's Helen actually there. There are a number of uh, seance photographs which are not very good. I mean, this could be psychical research, a psychical research photo, because you notice there. Do you notice here the uh, the legs of the all the participants are tied up, and um, there's this uh, there's a same goes for that chair, and they're holding hands there. You see, um, you see, it's it. I don't know the origins of that photo. Unfortunately, physical mediumship is. There's far less of it than there used to be. I mean, <clears throat> I've I've been uh, privileged, I think, to witness it in the sense that I I witnessed. Um, you may remember, you may remember my video where I, about Jason Harrington, where he did he did perform physical mediumship in front of me in in a seance, and I did witness some of it. It wasn't as spectacular as the things I hear from Helen's seances, but others people people like Victor and Wendy Zamet say they have. They claim to have witnessed uh, manifestation, full manifestation. I mean, not just transfiguration where a person's face and hands change, which is what I saw. When I saw hands change, not the face. If you remember the video I made about that, um, it's it's on my channel. Um, you know, f literally full body apparitions would appear in ectoplasm. But while that's the extent of most mediums mediuming, Helen was special. She had the gift. 
She couldn't just let the spirits speak through her. Oh, no, 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 no. She could physically manifest the spirits so that they could speak for themselves. Yeah. Helen Dung has often been described as the most powerful known medium in history. How the hell could she do that? I hear you ask. Well, <laughs> strap yourselves in. Once Helen was in the trance, a cloudy substance known as ectoplasm... There's a photo from Price's laboratory there. ...would come out... <laughs> I know. Would, ...would come out of her nose or mouth... It's and true, condense, mate. And condense, it's not so funny when you get used to it, you know. ...and into a ghost. <laughs> yep, that's what happens. What the fuck is that? Well, it's a good question. Um... It's ectoplasm, despite many claims, it's, ectoplasm is, is never, there's, a sample of it has never been taken. <laughs> <clears throat> uh, which condensed into a ghost, which was one of her two spirit guides named Peggy and Albert. <laughs> yeah, Albert was this old Australian guy, and Peggy was this little girl. But they'd be like a master of ceremonies, and they would all, they would actually allow other spirits to manifest. These these spirit guides then took the lead in passing on messages from the great beyond. And Correct. Yeah. All of this all of this went on with the lights turned off, leaving only a dim red light to illuminate the room. Because yeah, it was a twenty four watt bulb. Sometimes the the guides would even demand that someone put a cloth over it to dim it even more. So it was in dim light. Uh, this was not to. I mean, I know fake. You know, Darren Brown did this thing about this, and indeed, fake mediums have used darkness to conceal. There's no doubt about it. But that's that's not the purpose. That's not its purpose in terms of for Helen Duncan. It was literally because the necessity for darkness for the sake of the spirits. That's why it was necessary. Because of that, and Helen working her magic while obscured by a curtained box, you might be thinking that all of this sounds a little bit Wizard of Oz. And you would be right, because while she was spitting a lot of things out of her mouth, facts were not among them. Mm. Obviously, I disagree. She got almost everything wrong. No. In 1929, a paranormal investigator with the National Laboratory of Psychical Research named Harry Price. Yeah, um, he was actually a freelancer by the time he, um, he was um, Harry Price. He's talking to Harry Price. By the time Harry Price actually um, began his study on Helen Duncan, he was actually a freelancer. He was actually renting a room from the what's today called the uh, College of Psychic Studies and those it was the, in those days it was the London Spiritualist Alliance and I've actually been there I saw a lecture by Anthony Peak there a couple of years ago I'd made a video about it if you remember um, I actually tried to find Price's room but no one would show me apparently it was in the attic but um, I'm, I'd love to go back there maybe I'll have better luck next time but but there was a lot of trouble over that by the way um, b between Price and the LSA um, held about Helen and he was immediately suspicious so he started to... Well, that's fair enough. I think um, the purpose of Harry Price, I mean, I don't know if you've seen... Have you seen The Ghosts of Borley Rectory? That's a good film. It's, it's a new one that only came out a couple of years ago. It's actually got pretty good... It's a pretty good movie about the Borley Rectory case, which is fascinating. I won't go into it here right now, but it's one of Price's greatest achievements. Investigate her over the subsequent months. Um, you can actually you can actually find this if you go to Harry Price's website. It's um, just www.harryprice.com, I think it is, um, which he didn't set up himself because uh, Price, I think, went to the spirit world himself in 1946. But um, his supporters set up the website decades later, and it's all all his papers are on there, including the Helen Duncan report. But it is misleading, as I explain in my own lecture on Helen Duncan. Oops, come on. But he noticed that even though the spiritualists, including Helen, were carrying out the seances in the very same building that he worked in, he wasn't allowed to watch. No. Not only was he not invited, but even when he asked if he could attend, he was flat out told no. There was a huge amount of rivalry in psychical research these days. Now, as... As you know from my own talk, there was a, almost a, there was a kind of a tendering process when Helen went to London because they they all wanted they all wanted to investigate her. She was basically paid. She, I think she got a first class seat on the train or something like that. 
And uh, when she got to, to when she got to London, there was basically she signed an exclusivity contract with the LSA, and the LSA were kind of in a rivalry situation with Price, even though they were renting him his room. And um, he was he was he was not allowed. He was told you leave Helen Duncan alone. This is why it gets a bit sticky because he basically moonlighted her. He he kind of poached her from them. Um, and Helen unfortunately broke that exclusivity contract which is where all the trouble comes from i think this explains a lot of what went wrong with price because he was very angry with helen for not being more discreet things like that but nevertheless price was an expert in the arcane and black arts <laughs> sorry it's my awful matt berry impression he was still is that someone from harry potter i don't know still determined to get to the bottom of this witchy woman's wittering however <laughs> Oh, witchy, witchy women's wittery. <laughs> he's 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 very eloquent, actually, Danky. I must say, he's very he's very so sort of witty. He's witty. Well, it wasn't until 1931 that Price managed a breakthrough in his investigation. Helen's husband actually approached Price and offered him the chance to watch Helen carry out. A... I think it was 1930. So I'm I'm being I'm being pedantic now. Who cares if it's one year or another? But it was actually the same time. Uh, she had the study with the LSA. It was it was on the same visit. Which the LSA, I know the LSA was nineteen thirty. Price, I think um, it was the same time. Or I don't have all these facts to hand. It's all in in the background. Um, I'm going to recommend a good book to you. Okay, this is the book. Oops, sorry. This is the book here. Helen Duncan: The Mystery Show Trial by Robert Hartley. You can pause. I don't know if you can, but you can see the back cover. Actually, you can pause and read that. Um, it's not a diff it's not an easy book to get hold of actually i think there's a f if you want one get one now on amazon they are currently the paperback for 415 i don't even know if it's still in print there's paperbacks available now um including there's eight used ones for a cheaper price maybe it's still in print i hope so because i think it's a very very important book but um this i do recommend reading this for the background of what i'm talking about it's I've, it's been the basis of uh, my own talks on this matter my own analysis so i do get hold of a copy um so going back to dank what is what dank is up to here we go um seance probably seeing it as an opportunity to vindicate his wife's talents and generate some positive press yeah i mean uh, you could, that's perfectly understandable you know, to get to be verified by psychical researcher is a real feather in your cap it really really is and so um they probably want i mean if i'm guessing they probably wanted more than one researcher to i'm guessing of their motives now the reason that um helen and her husband decided to moonlight with harry price was because of that they wanted they wanted more than one report to make them look even better. For the low, low price of 50 old timey pounds, the fee was reluctantly agreed. And That's a lot in those days. 50 pounds in those days, a hell of a lot. And the examination began on May the 4th. But the was force... Star Wars Day, yeah. But, you know, I don't know why... Uh, I suppose it's, it's paying someone for their... to take part in... To take part in a um in a psychical research laboratory thing i mean i know how it looks and they must have realized how it would look but no uh, i don't know what's the what's the rights and wrongs of that but i mean there's certainly nothing immoral about it i mean charging for your time is fair enough helen charged for her time when she was a medium which is fair enough i mean i've i uh i if i went to one of these events i would i would pay i'd be willing to pay up I mean, for the thing with Jason Harrington, I, the thing with Jason Harrington, I, I had a kind of press pass, which is which is very generous of him to do that. But you know, if he if he said, "Oh, well, is the fee?" I'd have said, "Okay." Was not with Ellen at oh, all. Of course, <laughs> Price only had to take one single look at the scene for him to figure out exactly what was going on. And um, according, it seems his report is not accurate, and we I um I discussed this with Maggie when I interviewed her. And indeed, I bring this up in some in some of the some of the documents you see in the Helen Duncan portal, including what the famous ectoplasm was really made of. <coughs> to quote Price's casebook on the subject, the medium having donned her special garments, she was led into the séance room by Professor McDougall and myself, and placed in the curtained recess known as the cabinet. 
any few seconds, the medium was in a trance, and within a minute, the cabinet curtains parted, and we beheld the medium covered from head to foot with cheesecloth. Uh, no, not exactly. Now, um, this it, I can see why it does look like that. It does, I mean, it does resemble that. I mean, you can see it's, it's this thin fabric-like substance, but it's not cheesecloth. I'll let him carry on, though. We'll explain a bit more. There appeared to be yards of it. Some of it was trailing on the floor. One end was poked up her nostril. A piece was issuing from her mouth. Yeah, Helen's big party trick was basically she could swallow and regurgitate cheesecloth. That's tricky. Have you ever tried to do that? Um, I've never tr I've never tried to swallow and regurg regurgitate cheesecloth, I assure you. Uh, it can't be a very, very easy thing to do. But, um... <laughs> uh, but, um... Apparently that this was the theory. This is what Harry put Price put forward as his conclusion, and I think it was wrong. I think he had ul ul ulterior motives for denou for denouncing Helen Duncan as a fraud, and it had a lot to do with the legal situation he was in regarding the exclusivity contract. And I go into more details about that, like I say, in the background link below. As I said, look, I'm not going to repeat myself in this video. This is simply addressing Dankula and what he says. I have I, I covered. The the background to this is all available. It's on my channel. It's on other documents. It's in written work I've done. It's on um, the radio shows I did with Maggie and other people, and um, and things like that. So that's I, I do recommend you do look into the background to this. It's a very interesting story. And of course, buy the book I recommended. Let's go back to Dank. But just to be sure, Price did obtain a sample of the stuff for the purpose of eventually reverse engineering his own recipe. Well, he he obtained something. Look, he said I, he said he'd cut this piece off. Um, whether he did or not is another matter. However, Helen did not make it easy for him, and the struggle to procure the stuff sounded like quite a hoot. As Price put it himself. The sight of half a dozen men, each with a pair of scissors, waiting for the word, was amusing. It came, and we all jumped. One of the doctors got hold of the stuff and secured the piece. The medium screamed, and the rest of the teleplasm went down her throat. This time, it wasn't cheesecloth. It proved to be paper soaked in white of egg. Paper soaked in egg white? I mean, that's even... How do you swallow all these things and bring them up again? <laughs> it's like, <clears throat> firstly, how do you, you, she'd have to regurgitate it, literally, to vomit it. And make sure she only vomited the cheesecloth, not her breakfast she had this morning, as Mr. Orton of the Magic Circle pointed out. I'll come to that in a minute. But then she'd have to find a way to swallow it back in again. I mean, it, it makes the mind boggle. It's revolting. I mean, I would. it's not a story you should ever tell at mealtimes. And folded into a flattened tube. Often the <laughs> egg white and paper folded into flattened tube. I mean, goodness me, this is the kind of it's not it sounds like nursery school <laughs> games. Ectoplasm would also have ghostly appendages attached to the ends to really sell the whole cloudy matter coalescing into an apparition vibe, such as faces cut out from magazines <laughs> or fucking rubber gloves. <laughs> <laughs> that. I'm sorry. It doesn't look a rubber glove, though, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> um, look, I'm sorry for that. That is one of the stupidest things I've ever seen. <laughs> that is the dumbest, dumbest thing I've ever well, yeah, yeah, I'm glad you find it amusing, Dank, but you know, it may not actually be true. Bear that in mind. It may not be true. Seen. I can't tell what's more embarrassing. The fact that Helen tried to trick people with this, this absolute blatant bullshit, or the fact that in some cases it actually worked. No, neither, neither, Dan. She didn't, you see, I don't, I don't think Price's report was accurate for reasons I describe in the, in the background. Um, I'm not the only one who says this. It's, it's actually briefly referred to in here because there's some background and some introduction in the book, in um, Hartley's book here. What can you see it there? Um, he refers to like the, the, the history behind Helen Duncan, what happened over the previous decade, which is really quite this is the decade before the trial and before then, because um, really this is the, the, what happened at the trial in a way was the as an end of like a process that go back goes back about fifteen years, 
but um, Harry Price, you see, was invited to the court. This is suspicious. He was invited to court to the court to coach the prosecution witnesses. I mean, it's it's, it's a long story, but they're, they're, it's all very very suspicious. Despite having been paid what is worth over four grand today to reveal her secrets, Helen didn't <coughs> take too kindly to Price's attempts to X-ray her as part of the examination. Now that, that's actually true. She stormed out. The, she actually stormed out of Price's laboratory. Uh, Molly Goldney, the nurse, was wanted to like. She she allowed Molly Goldney, the the nurse, to um, poke and prod her. You know, she always did. She was always quite happy to be uh, f finger searched in all the bits and pieces, you know, all the nooks and crannies where me you know mediums were alleged to have secreted all kinds of props for their act. But. Um, she, she she actually um the the actual cause of the of the ruckus was actually an argument with her husband and it was all connected with the lsa because they must have realized something strange was going on upstairs and i don't know i can't remember all the details but i know helen had a row with her husband and basically she, i think she assaulted him at one point and walked out walked out of price's laboratory and out of that house where the ls where what is today the college of psychical studies and just stormed off into the street she actually went to the docks and caught a coastal ship back to scotland um left harry her husband to find his own way home it was a really big but it wasn't to do with the x-ray i mean maybe now's the time to point, point out mr orton and what he said this is the leader of the magic circle because he also did his own study on Helen. And as leader of the magic circle, he knows magical tricks. A magician is the best person for this sort of thing because they know all the, all the, the scams, um, which is why so many magicians are skeptics, but some are not. You see some, um, some magicians get into psychical research and believe there is a reality behind it. But, you know, he actually mentions the time when Helen produced ectoplasm after he literally witnessed her eating a meal. Now, you can, re if, if there is some way you can regurgitate cheesecloth from your gullet or your stomach, God knows how you do that. Not only regurgitate it and make it wrap around yourself the way it does in Price's photograph, then make it, then you have to go, go, it's called, how do you go, go, go like that to get it back in again, which makes you've got to re-swallow it. And you can't use your hands because they're tied to the, the arms of the chair. You can, I suppose you'd be going. I don't know how you do that. I mean, it's, it sounds revolting, doesn't it? I'm gonna no, no I'm not, not going to try. It. I'm not going to try it. <laughs> Though you can probably guess why. Helen no. got out of it by not true. Just going absolutely hysterical and running out into the street where yeah. only her husband managed to restrain her. Well, he didn't, you see. She, um, from, what, from what I gather, she didn't, he didn't succeed. And then Henry later refused to empty his pockets or submit to a search. Price was quick to speculate the obvious. Henry had taken the ectoplasm from Helen and hid it. But well, in, what, in the in laboratory in front of... In front of Price and all his observers? Seriously? I mean, this this is rather like what comes up in the court, you know, because this, of course, comes up in the court case, doesn't it? Well, where's the ectoplasm then? It's, it's, um, I find that unbelievable. They're blaming Price for hiding the ectoplasm. They're blame, blaming, Price and his colleagues are blaming Helen's husband for hiding the ectoplasm. No. But the embarrassingly <laughs> amateur stagecraft doesn't end there because I haven't shown it's, it's worth reading alternative sources to this dang, not just one. New Helen's spirit guides yet. In 1928, a photographer oh, named Harvey Metcalf managed to snap some pictures. And I'm just going to leave this on the screen for a minute. Just look, look at that. Look at that. James Cameron and Weta Workshop. Eat your fucking hearts out. What in the blue paper mache art attack fuck is this supposed to be? <laughs> As a puppet made out of paper mache mask and sheet, I would say that it's more Henson than haunted if it wasn't for the fact that it's so egregiously obvious that it couldn't even have scared Michael Caine. I mean, anyone who believes something this stupid is clearly fucking gonzo. 
Only an absolute muppet would fall for this. But they, didn't, fact- but they didn't, you see. Uh, the Metcalf photos from 1928, as I explain, they were actually taken from an Australian magazine. They were not photographs of Helen in trance. They were reproductions. Helen, I mean, it's very, he's right. It's, it's very obvious that those are, are just puppets. The faces are made from papier-mâché and painted. The, the body, the, there's, this white, there's this white cloth they put over them. And um, it just seems to be attached to Helen's nose and mouth. And, of course, the shoulders, which you can see very clearly are coat hangers. In fact, one of these puppets, you can actually see what type of coat hanger it is. One of the puppets has like a, it's, it's one of those arch-shaped coat hangers. And the other one, the one he just showed, it's one of those long straight coat hangers with little bits sticking up at the end. So, yeah, but the thing about it is Metcalf is not pretending that's Helen in trance. That was not a photo of Helen in trance. That was a reconstruction of what one might see at a seance, which is the best they could do in those days. So they didn't have wetter workshops and James Cameron. Um, it's the best they could do um, to to simulate what one might see. So they basically made some dummies and got some cloth and put, attached it to Helen's mouth and nose. These photos come up again and again, and they're often... They're very often presented as, look, this is this is this is a photo of Helen in trance. It's obviously fake. Very obviously fake. Whereas actually it's not a photo, it's not it never it was never originally meant to be a photo of Helen in trance. It was published in an Australian magazine. It was actually Victor Zamet who told me about this. He's got the magazine, he's got a copy of the magazine, you can see it, and it's very clearly part of a story, which is and they even admit in the they even admit in the article. Um, which Metcalf for which Metcalf provided the fo- provided the photos. They even admit that this is this is not real. It's what you're supposed. This is a reconstruction of what you would see as best as they can reconstruct it. That the true nature of <coughs> Helen's powers isn't abundantly obvious to you yet, for whatever fucking reason. I'll let Price himself give you the conclusion of his study. And I must say that I was deeply impressed. I was impressed with the brazen effrontery that prompted the Duncans to come to my laboratory in an attempt to put over their stuff on our experts. I was impressed with the amazing credulity of the spiritualists who had sat with the Duncans for six solid months and the fact that they had advertised her phenomena as genuine. Basically, Helen's bullshit was so obviously fake that Price was actually impressed that she still tried to push it anyway. Price had outed Helen as a complete fucking fraud. Uh, no, as as I explained in the background, there's this Price's report is not it was not an honest account of what happened in that laboratory in 1930. And the word spread quickly as the results of other investigations started to come out. That same year, the London Spiritualist Alliance examined ectoplasm samples that all turned out to be either cheesecloth or paper mixed with egg white. Yeah, and they were cheated by Helen, remember? This is is what it's all about. This is why they did this. They then called Helen's bluff by getting her to swallow a methylene blue tablet before the seance. And you'll never guess what happened. She didn't produce any ectoplasm. I can't. I remember the talking about the, the the glowing blue tablet. I remember that, um, and I can't remember because I can't remember the details. But Dank is now saying that she didn't produce any ectoplasm at that time. You know, maybe maybe that's true. I don't. Know, I can't remember the details of that. Plasm. People began to denounce <coughs> Helen in droves, including the Morning Post and the London Psychic Laboratory. <coughs> the heat was so bad that even some of her fellow morons turned on her. However, somehow, all of this ultimately only ended up being good advertising for Helen, as her services were in more demand than ever due to her clash with the scientists. Yeah, well, maybe they heard that. Maybe they heard the uh, the other side of the story, and they realised the background behind it. Because this this was a long time ago. We're talking like ninety plus years ago. Yet, in nearer the time. It would have been more apparent. It would have been. It would have been more current. It would have been a current affair, because spiritualists are fucking idiots. Who needs very droll? No, no. Then, then well, you, I don't have to add anything to that, do I? Facts and logic when you have cheesecloth. But in January of 1933, the spiritualists were unable to cope for much longer. 
because an audience member seeing the opportunity to further prove that Helen was a fraud actually grabbed Helen's puppet during a seance. This is Essen Mall, yes. Essen Mall carried out a a 10-year campaign of, of hatred against Helen. I don't know what, exactly why that was all about. What was that all about? And tore it, proving that it wasn't a ghost. It was just some piece of shit cobbled together from the contents of our drawers. Yeah, this this was this was what Maul retrieved. This is a court. These labels here refer to uh, the fact that it's a court exhibit because Helen did actually get prosecuted for this, as as Dank is going to explain in a minute. This is a, this is actually a slip. It's actually a, a woman's undergarment, and you see here where it's been ripped. There. Now that to me, if you if you Judge, if you like, imagine those. That's where the arms go through there in the head. This is probably a size fourteen to sixteen slip, which Helen apparently removed from her body somehow, even though her hands were tied, and used it to fake the ectoplasm. She didn't regurgitate this. Maul never suggested that she regurg she regurgitated this. But um, how would how would Helen have got that on? Helen, you've seen photos of her. She's no ballerina. She probably needed something like size 20, 22 or something like that. I mean, doesn't sound very likely she actually wore that and removed it. So even if she had her hands free, managed somehow to slip it off herself in the cabinet without anyone knowing and somehow make that look like ectoplasm, she can't, it can't have been she wore it. Anyway, um, as a result, Helen was prosecuted in Edinburgh that May for being a fraudulent medium. She was fined £10 and jailed for a month. Guess the spirits didn't warn her about that. You would think that a fraud conviction in an actual court of law would have been the final nail in the coffin for Helen's career. But you would be wrong. She just found a different group of morons to swindle. A local church in Portsmouth invited Helen to demonstrate her abilities in 1941. Yeah, this is the Master Temple, which I've been to. I mean, if you watch my Helen Duncan tour, you'll know that I actually went there. And I've actually reproduced the scene of when the, the residence, it's actually someone lives there now. It's a flat, but they very kindly allowed me into the into the room which was the master temple and allowed me to film. It's just someone's lounge now. But there's like a little wooden step by the the window, which is original. It was there in, in, for, in, in the 40s. So she started to do seance <coughs> there, and she did an awful lot of them. Because you see, Portsmouth was a critically important dockyard for the Royal Navy. And by this point... Mm, it still is today, yeah. World War II was in full swing. Yeah, she, she began the seances at the, at the Master Temple in 1941. So, thanks to the demand from anxious and grief-stricken relatives of sailors in the area who were so desperate that they wanted spiritual help to keep their loved ones safe, business was booming in Portsmouth almost as much as it was in Clyde Bank. And it's understandable when you consider what it must have been like to be in World War II. I mean, if we look back at it as a piece of history, but to be in it... Um, in the middle of it, it's like not knowing how it was going to end. It's scary. And as I said, by the end of it, what, uh, 300,000 plus um, people were, you know, British troops were killed. I think uh, 60,000 people died in the Blitz at home. Um, yeah, it was, it must have been a bit of a nightmare. As Helen got to work, she immediately got herself into trouble when she summoned the spirit of a dead sailor. In November yeah. of 1941, Helen called up the ghost of a sailor named Sid, who told her about the sinking of a ship named HMS Barham, which had been torpedoed by a German U-boat. Correct. In fact, it was it was actually um, the spirit guide, Albert, who first mentioned that he had 1,400 new souls in the spirit world. These were the officers and men of HMS Barham, because 1,400 uh, sailors were killed. I think, was it... Was it Hood 1400, 800 of Barham? I can't remember. But anyway, a large number of um, spirits entered the spirit world at that moment. And Albert had them there with him, yeah. But the thing is that the sinking of the ship 
wasn't actually announced until the following January because the government kept it secret to mislead the Germans and keep up morale at home. Yeah, they they did. It was it was a state secret. You still I think you still see me, can't you? Yes, it was uh, kept. It was kept highly classified. Um. <clears throat> so Helen had just blotted out a really big military secret. She did the same thing with HMS Hood a few months later. Yeah. Upon hearing this, the Navy immediately went, how the fuck did she know that? And they instantly went after her. Yeah, we have a letter from Brigadier Roy Firebrace, who was head of uh, Naval Intelligence for Scotland, specifically recommending that Helen Duncan would be watched. She'd be watched by MI5, basically. And you could be damn sure, like, if... if um, if our side were watching her, you can be damn sure the enemy were as well. They would have got wind of this. They'd have inserted their own agents into uh, their own secret agents to monitor Helen. You can bet. I feel that she would spill <coughs> even more military secrets, like the date, time, and location of the D-Day landings that they were planning. This is why the persecution against her began in the spring of '44. This is why. It's, it's, it's the timing is just too coincidental. One Navy lieutenant suspected that Helen was a fraud, so he decided to do a little bit of undercover... Yes, that's Stanley Worth and his friend Rupert Cross, who was um, a, a police constable. You know. But they didn't decide that. I think they were put onto it. I mean, as I explained in the background, there's like a cabal here involving people like Maud, who was the prosecution barrister, the judge, the recorder of London, Dodson... Um, Ian Fleming, the guy who, he's not only famous for writing James Bond, he was also involved in the disinformation for D-Day, where basically fake documents were planted on to, to, were planted to be picked up by the Italians and Germans, saying that it was all going to, all the action was going to happen in the Mediterranean, and nothing was going to happen actually in the North Sea in Britain. Sleuthing and bought two tickets to her show for 25 shillings each. And what he saw could only be described as very, very sloppy on Helen's part. So he said in court, but, uh, well, Worth then, strangely enough, emigrated to New Zealand. And um, since then, after that, he was a bit difficult to get a hold of. Because during the seance, a ghost revealed itself as that same lieutenant's dead aunt. A dead aunt who never existed. Later on, Helen then summoned another ghost, which was the ghost of this lieutenant's dead sister. But while well, he actually did have a sister, she wasn't dead. The lieutenant was so incensed by this trick that he knew he had to do something to stop Helen. He's going to bring her to justice. Yeah, We, we think that it's a, it's a Lieutenant Worth, or Lieutenant Worth, as the Scottish people would say, was somehow he just did this completely out of a sense of personal duty. To quote Dank himself, Bullshit! So, who are you going to call? The cops, because ghosts aren't real. The cops <laughs> yes, they are. soon started yeah. their own investigation. And then... This during... is odd, yeah, because um, Worth and Cross, Cross, of course, was a police constable, but um, Worth was also a family friend of um, Arthur West, who was chief constable in Portsmouth at that time. And again, it's all connected. Const and what's more, um, he'd been accused of fraud at the, the, the Old Bailey. I mean, he was he was involved in, uh, he was accused of lying. Uh, he was actually, someone accused him of perjury. It's, it's a long story, but basically it was two, it was literally two cases going on at the same time in the Old Bailey involving Arthur West. And he was on suspicion of perjury at one of them. A seance on the 19th of January, 1944, <coughs> it was go time. A plain clothes officer that was hiding in the audience revealed himself and blew a whistle to alert the other cops waiting outside to start the raid. He then made a grab for the ectoplasm, but Helen <laughs> snorted it back in. What do you think it is? A line of cocaine, for goodness sake? She snorted it back in. Oh, right. There. Where did the Before ectoplasm... he could get a sample of what he could clearly see was just a sheet. She snorted this sheet of cheesecloth or whatever it was, and it was a, enough, to, you know, big enough to cover a king, a king sized bed because it supposedly was uh, her, covered her entire body. And she snorted it back into her nose. I mean, this course came up in the court all the time. This was a big thing in the court uh, that Charles Lowesby pressed 
You say, well, where's the where's the ectoplasm? Where's this fake ectoplasm then? You said you grabbed it. You had you had you had your hold on it. The, the your the the cops were in in a moment. They basically rushed. They rushed the entire inner temple and the, the master temple. And they all came thumping up the stairs and into the room. So, where is this vital piece of forensic evidence? And Kadang said, "Oh, she snorted it back up her nose. Oh dear, he's oh Dankula needs he needs really to learn a little bit more about <laughs> mediumship and spiritualism." Nevertheless, the raid ended with the arrest of Helen and three members <laughs> of the audience. Helen was that was the uh, that was the people who ran that that was the, that was the um that was the couple that ran the chemist shops downstairs. They were they were this the this is it was a chemist's. Um, what were their names? I can't remember what their names were, but um, Mr. and Mrs. Uh, Homer, Mr. and Mrs. Homer, who ran the the chemist shop downstairs, they were arrested as accessories. Yeah, they were charged under Section Four of the Vagrancy Act of eighteen twenty four. Such was mm. the that's the same that's the same prosecution she had in nineteen thirty three when Essen Mall supposedly. Um, Blew the whistle on her. Procedure for <laughs> fortune tellers, astrologers, and spiritualists, which meant that she was facing a maximum penalty of five shillings. However, given the sensitive nature of some of the stuff she was saying and the Navy's concern with intelligence leaks, that charge was soon upgraded to conspiracy. And if convicted, well, getting convicted of conspiracy during a war well let's just say that helen would very soon get to meet the spirits in person but she was never accused of treason or anything like that but um she was of course he's about to explain what happened next but basically what he said was true about um the vagrancy act and how that was eventually dropped and and basically aggrandized and upgraded the charges changed as helen's <coughs> case get yanked all the way up the chain to the old bailey resulting in helen being charged under Section 4 of the Witchcraft Act of 1735, yeah. which was the first prosecution under this law in over a century. Now, to be yeah. very, Weird, very clear, this was not a literal witch trial, which is... Uh, no, this, the witch, witch trial is the is a catchphrase to describe this it's called it's um it's called the mystery show trial the book but it's it's often been called the witchcraft trial or the last witch and things like that but i know he's about to explain what the witchcraft act really is how many modern witches like to portray <coughs> it the witchcraft act wasn't a law against witches but a law against claiming that someone had supernatural abilities in order to defraud or mislead someone. That's correct, like, yeah. saying you can make magic potions that cure all diseases, only 10 shillings a bottle, but then it turns out it's just some daffodil petals and Coca-Cola. That is what the Witchcraft Act is, yeah. It was to stop people from getting conned. It was essentially the law that abolished witch hunts and attempted to stamp out belief in witches. Well, no, it was. I suppose you could call it one of the earliest consumer laws, consumer protection legislation, I suppose. Sadly, it failed. Four waves of feminism later, and this is what women <laughs> choose to do with their rights. <laughs> He's funny, I must say. He's funny. What a waste. But anyway, the government was so out to get Helen that they were dusting off some really old legal tomes. And for good measure, Helen was also charged under the Larceny Act for falsely pretending that she was in a position to bring about the appearances of the spirits or deceased persons for financial gain. Helen's yes. week-long trial attracted quite a bit of media attention, with newspapers publishing cartoons of witches on broomsticks like there was no tomorrow. Yeah. This ended up bringing the case to the attention... It's inevitable they were going to call it the witchcraft trial, yeah, the witchcraft, yeah. ...of a bunch of enraged spiritualists who rallied behind Helen. Yeah, yeah, Winston Churchill, of course. I think he's going to mention Winston Churchill in a minute, actually. They even raised a defence fund, and I'd be really interested to see... How That's true, they really... they were. This was considered... She was considered a martyr. It was a massive campaign to defend her. This this eventually evolved into a campaign to pardon her, which is still going on today, and has made some progress. How those dumb fucking proto hippies tricked their husbands <laughs> into giving them money to defend this utter clown. The spiritualists also because she was not an utter clown, and they knew that. Provided a legion of witnesses who gave evidence, if you want to call it that. 
Yeah, too many actually. I mean, there's a list of them here. Um, if anything, they overdid it. They overdid the whole thing. Um, where's the details? Oh, you, you, it's in the book somewhere. There's a whole list. There's a whole page which, which has an entire list of all the witnesses. And there's like a this is this is this is an artist impression of what people saw. There was um this this is all the witnesses here. They're all there. I don't know how much of that you can see. Um, obviously, you can't read it. I haven't. I'm not going to. I've still got it on screen share. But um, Mrs. Cole, Mrs. Alabaster, Mrs. Williams, Mrs. Tremlett, Mrs. Sullivan, Mrs. Culture, Mrs. Wheatcroft, etc., etc. It goes all the way down here. You know, Mr. Barnes, Mr. Skill, Mr. Mackey. Yeah. Um, they overdid it, the prosecution. They should have kept it simple. Such as one client who testified to have. I mean, this defense. The, the defence overdid it, yeah. Having <laughs> seen his dead wife emerging from the ectoplasm and then asking him and his sister-in-law to stand up. After they obliged, the dead wife then allegedly took off her wedding ring and put it on her sister's finger while saying, it is my wish that this takes place for the sake of my little girl. A year later, the guy had married his dead wife's sister. And when they saw Helen again afterwards, the dead wife appeared again and allegedly blessed both of them. I now, know about this. we've already gone over... This, this, is a new, this is a new one on me. ...the myriad of reasons why this is completely absurd. But I also can't personally imagine anyone, dead or alive, cucking themselves. <laughs> and I especially can't imagine anyone telling their spouse to fuck their sister. <laughs> I think this guy was just sick of people judging him for nailing his dead wife's sister, and he saw an opportunity to tell the public, well, actually, the ghost of my dead wife said it was okay. The defence... <laughs> it's like, he's funny, but... Yeah, um, I don't... I didn't... I've not heard that story, a little anecdote there. But, of course, there was, there's always... For people to do things like that, they do sometimes make up excuses, but I didn't know that was connected to Helen, if, if it's true. ...presented 49 witnesses, mm. all with similar testimonies, including a client that claimed to have seen the ghost of Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, because, yeah, sure, fuck it, why not? If you're going to take the piss, you might as well have some fun with it. But... This high number of witnesses was actually part of the defence's plan to just keep flooding the courtroom with nutcases to wear the judge down so that the judge would eventually agree to let him... Now, I don't, now, <clears throat> I don't think that was Lowsby's intention. He didn't say, well, let's just keep... Let's just keep... He, he knew the court... I mean, he wasn't actually a barrister. He was... Um, he was... He was a qualified solicitor, but he wasn't... He was, wasn't a member of the... He wasn't... Had never been called to the bar. Is he was facing Henry Elam and um, and John Maud KCs, who were um, they were members of the Inner Temple and things like that, but um, Lowsby wasn't. However, he knew he knew courts and the law well enough to realise that trick wouldn't work. The judge would just say the judge what the judge would have done. He would simply have just he would just dismissed like half the witnesses. Um, if that was that was that was if that had been Lowsby's intention, because the judge would have seen through it. Judges aren't stupid. They would have seen through it. Uh, they probably worn an expression a bit like that, <laughs> where I've paused it with, with Dank's expression there. <laughs> um, no, no, Lowsby's, Lowsby's intention was... He, he wasn't really focusing too much on those witnesses. He wanted them all there. He chose too many of them. But his, he believed that he would get the case dismissed on the next part of the trial, when, which is the most interesting thing of all, which D Dank is about to explain and actually carry out a seance yep. in the courtroom to demonstrate her abilities. Mm -hmm. And it worked. The judge... No, it didn't. It didn't. Um, it, was, it was a good attempt, but it didn't. ...for the jury the chance to actually see Helen do a seance. No, the judge overruled it at first and said, no way. I'm not having this sort of thing in my court. Lowsby then just explained to him how how important and, and he, he appealed that and he explained how important it was for obvious reasons. If Helen could produce, if Helen could produce exoplasm and do a séance in court, it would then raise the question: Well, why does she have to fake stuff if she can do it for real? And the, what happened was then it was only they they reached a compromise where where Dodson, the the um, the, the, the judge, the recorder, then. 
agreed to poll the jury and Lowsby said, OK, we'll poll the jury. And he assumed that the jury would choose to see it, if only for their own curiosity. Once. However, the defence's gambit was quickly thwarted because yeah. the jury just went, no. That does that really is baffling. Would you really have voted against that if you'd been on that jury? Just for your own curiosity. Would, would you really have done that? The jury were just absolutely sick of this shit and they just wanted to go home to their families. Well, you could, you could, that's a supposition on his part. We don't know that. Which is understandable after having been dragged all the way to London from Portsmouth for a week-long trial that kept being interrupted by bombings because the blitz was mm. happening all around them. Adding a seance to the proceedings would have just added more time to the whole ordeal, a lot more than the jury were willing to spend. Um, again, that's a supposition. Maybe, who knows what motivated them. So the jury just said, no. And this was probably for the best, because putting on a display like that in the Old Bailey of all places, surrounded by people that weren't absolutely bananas, would have been extremely fucking embarrassing. Well, it would have... No, no. You see, if Helen could have done that, all, they would have been... They would have, they, they would have made sure that there were no tricks involved. It would have changed the world. We'd have had a situation like the Discovery. If you remember my my uh, review of the film discovery it would have been like that we we it would have transformed society forever if that happened which is maybe obviously they wanted to get helen in jail which is why they did they obviously i think they probably fiddled the jury polls because they want they were desperate to get that defense case collapsed they wanted to collapse the defense case so they could get helen in jail for nine months but it also would have... oh yeah it was actually only six i mean he's going to explain the, the sentence was nine months, but she got time served because, believe it or not, Helen was not offered. She was not offered bail. She was not offered. To, I mean, I don't understand that. Why? 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 Why wasn't she offered bail? I mean, it it just it it basically she was held on remand for the entire period. I mean, why she was only released very shortly before the trial to just to to to, to consult with her solicitor. But why the hell? It's not. It's not like she's some kind of like mad axe murderer or something. Why? Why was she? Why was she refused bail? Been absolutely hilarious. So I'm actually kind of disappointed that it yeah. wasn't allowed. I am too, for a different reason. The prosecution then tried to call Helen as a witness for cross examination, but the defence shot that down because now, Helen never said a word while she was in the dock. Is she was actually in a trance during her seances and therefore couldn't recall what was said or done. Yeah. My, That's correct. How convenient. No, it's Helen just correct. Helen was so committed to the bit that she was found to have owned an HMS Barham hat band that was apparently left behind by the sailor's ghost. However, what Helen didn't seem to realise was that sailor's hat bands didn't actually have the ship names on them. And this is where we get to the elephant in the room. Um, How can... did Helen actually... That's a new one on me. I'm, I'm just topping up my dragon juice here. I could always edit these things out. You know, I'm not going live, but I can't be bothered. Um, the, the, the hatbound thing, there's rumours I've heard about the hatbound thing, but what, why would a hatbound in ectoplasm survive as a solid object, basically becoming a port? That doesn't make sense, so I've never really taken that very seriously know about the sinking of the HMS yeah, Barham. That, that is a that's an important point, yeah. Well, it's because it probably wasn't as much of a secret as the government wanted it to be. Well, you would think that the secret could be contained because only the casualties' families were told. Well, they weren't all, you see. A few, some of them were. I don't know exactly how they selected it, but some some of the, the sailors' families were not told. Um... Yeah, that was in the that was in that that was in that documentary that um, that Maggie. I think Maggie's got the only copy of it left in the world, the one with Elaine Smith playing Helen. That's bloody brilliant. And all of them were told to keep their mouths shut, but the total number of families told was eight hundred and sixty-two. No, it was far less than that. <clears throat> eight hundred and sixty-two families. So, a few thousand people at least knew about the sinking. And for the secret to get out, all it takes is one to open their mouth. It's technically possible that Helen had had got wind of this. It's not; it can't be ruled out. But when you consider the hood as well, 
the the HMS Hood, which happened earlier. Um, it's the, the thing about what with the Hood was. It happened. It was literally, if you if you if you look, remember my my talk that I did on this with HMS Hood. The news, the news of the this is what this is what galvanized Roy Fire uh, Roy uh, Firebrace because he was a member of the SPR. He was a friend of Alistair Crowley. He knew Fleming as well. And they were they were all psych interested in psychic research. He actually phoned the Admiralty and said, "I've just I've just been to a bloody séance and the medium has said HMS Hood has been sunk." And uh, is that true? And they said, "No, no, we'll get back to you." They phoned him back a couple of hours later and said, "No, it is true." So Helen found out about this even before the bloody Admiralty did. She couldn't have got it that way. She couldn't have got it simply from rumours. Or to post it in a Discord somewhere. And the secret is not really a secret if it... I think that's a reference to the guy who's just been arrested for, for giving away state secrets. At least a few thousand people know about it. They also, didn't. these families have mums, sisters, aunties, etc. So it should be pretty obvious that when all of the men are off fighting and the country is full of more women than ever, secrets just don't exist anymore because women fucking gossip. <laughs> you misogynist. <laughs> so Helen probably just heard about the HMS Barnum sinking through the grapevine as local gossip. Well, how did she find out about the hood sinking then? Because literally she knew before anyone else did. She, this was literally only just after it happened. And even the Admiralty didn't find out. At the end of Helen's trial, the jury took only half an hour to convict her under the Witchcraft Act. Though the other charges were dropped. This made her the second last person to ever be convicted under the Witchcraft Act. And the last to be jailed under it. She was then sentenced to nine months in Holloway Prison and, quite controversially, was not allowed to appeal her sentence to the House of Lords. Despite yeah. Helen's crimes being quite minor, albeit pretty ghoulish, she was treated extra harshly because she was, she was still deemed a bit of a national security risk. Well, what happened on June the 6th of that year? While she was languishing in, in Holloway Prison, what happened? Operation Overlord, D-Day, at the Allied Invasion of Europe. That's why they were so harsh with her. That's why they wouldn't let her appeal. This is why they knew that they knew that as soon as she was out of jail practicing again, there'd be more leaks. D-Day was coming up, so the spooks <coughs> were extra spooked about any potential leaks that could give the game away. Basically, yes. I mean, really, this is irrelevant. The, the argument over whether Helen was genuine or not, or whether spiritualism is genuine or not, or whether there's a spirit world or not, is kind of a separate issue to the fact that people within the defence establishment of the United Kingdom believed it, even the Prime Minister. So, and he, well, he was kept out of the loop, as you'll see. But that's the point. People believed she was real. Regardless of how small the risk. So they wanted Helen kept the fuck out of the way yeah. until they could get the party started. However, Helen found a lot more mercy on the inside than she did in the courtroom. Helen's cell door was apparently never locked, and by all accounts, she was treated rather well because a large swathe of the that's not what I heard population believed that she had fallen victim to a miscarriage of justice. Well, she had, but. Um... That had nothing to do with her treatment in jail, I think. She even continued to <clears throat> ply her trade to other prisoners, staff, and the many people that came to visit. In Again, I don't think that's true. Including Winston Churchill. No. Yes. No, he didn't. Churchill had a bit of a spiritual streak as he a did. result of the Boer War. M which is true. Churchill did, was a believer, yes. While he was on the run after escaping capture, he felt like he was being guided by something supernatural that brought him to safety. Upon hearing about Helen, Churchill declared that the whole trial was fucking stupid and wrote a memo demanding a obsolete tomfoolery was the word he used he was a bit more polite than those days. report on the witchcraft act in which he called the whole affair obsolete tomfoolery and yeah. he saw it as just a massive waste of the he didn't visit helen in jail maggie my interview with maggie she's very clear about this the family know all about this and see he, uh, he never visited her in jail but he he did i he was on her side definitely court's time and resources yeah. i mean they did go a little bit overboard but helen did still deserve to go down for fraud 
After no, she didn't. After serving six months of her sentence, Helen was released from prison on the 22nd of September 1944, and she vowed never to give another seance. And considering what we know about Helen's integrity, it shouldn't surprise you that she almost immediately went back on this promise. I don't know if that's the case. Um, I know that whether that was simply her going back on a promise. I know that she was very bitter. She was very angry about the way she'd been treated, quite understandably. And she was especially annoyed that she'd not been allowed to perform a seance in court because basically, I'm sure Lowsby would have reassured her, don't worry, all you've got to do is do your seance in, do your seance in court. They can't stop you. It's essential to your use. It's essential for your defence. And then you, you basically will prove yourself innocent because you will prove that you can do it for real. Which means the prosecution will then have to prove why would someone who can do real seances have to fake them? Because it would, it would, it would flip the advantage to the defence. And when Dodson scuppered the whole idea with that ridiculous jury poll, that's when the defence case collapsed. Helen was angry about that. She was angry that, she, and she, she never really got over it. I don't think. Claiming to have felt a strong call from the spirit world, the quality, if you could call it that, of the seances then declined, with fellow spiritualists turning against her and the spiritualist governing body actually withdrawing her diploma. Is that true? I, mean, I don't know about that. I know that she, she had a much lower profile after, after her incarceration. That's right. Helen was such a blatant fake that even her fellow lunatics were disavowing her. And with no, a lot of them supported her, and they still do to this day. Her reputation deeper in the <coughs> gutter than ever, Helen just couldn't catch a break for the rest of her life. In November of 1956. Interesting, there's a connection. I'm sorry, a bit of a, an aside here. There's a connection between uh, Helen's case and this one. Oops, am I? You still got me. You still got me, haven't you? Yeah. And this one, this this, this day for freedom video. This day for freedom video. Now, as you'll know, in the if you watch the whole thing, there was a performance by someone singing "Read All About It" by. Emily Sandy, um, Emily Sandy, read all about it by Emily Sandy. There is a performance of that song uh, by an artist at the Day for Freedom rally, which I went to. Um, and he apparently Helen, Helen, who's in, she's in regular contact with, um, with her friends and, and people and her supporters today <coughs> who are still around because, of course, she can now communicate from the spirit world. And she she keeps an eye on what's going on in the world as, it, as she's left behind. As I've definitely said, spirit they seem to have some spirits have the ability to do that. They can still see into our world like Astain's father did with me. Um, and um, she loves that song. Read all about it by Emily Sandy. That's what that's her favourite song. So should we carry on with old Danky? Here he is. In November of 1956, a seance in Nottingham was raided, with the cops strip-searching her and carrying out a lot of flash photography. Yeah, this was um, an awful situation, um, which I describe in my videos about this subject. This raid ultimately proved to be career-ending for Helen. Interestingly, if you remember from the tour video, the, the, the residents of that house in West Bridgeford, Nottingham, they still they didn't like me filming outside. They knew I was there. They knew what I was talking about. And it seems that even after all these years, there's still a, a stigma associated with it in that area. Not because she was outed as a fraud again, but because allegedly she was seriously injured by the ectoplasm shooting back inside her too fast after her trance was interrupted. According that happens when you suddenly switch on lights and things like that. Um, the medium can be seriously injured and she... <clears throat> oops come on well lunatics the light touching the ectoplasm from the flash photography you know touching the fucking cheesecloth apparently caused some type of spiritual reaction you know yeah, so does. apparently light deals 48 psychic damage whenever it touches cheesecloth not cheesecloth ectoplasm but yes Helen suffered major burns Personally, I think the cardinal sin of dealing with mediums and trances is allowing them to carry on exploiting the grieving and emotionally vulnerable for money. That's not very original, Dank. That is typical sceptic rhetoric. I think it's unfair in the case of Helen and many other mediums. But, what do I know? 
Helen was then... Not a lot, mate, it seems. ...rushed back home to Edinburgh after she was hit by the backfiring ectoplasm that, according to her fellow lunatics, left her with two second-degree burns on her stomach. Actually, it was a local doctor as well who was called by the police to, to look after her, but yeah. And it seemed that Helen did actually have an injury or something wrong with her, because five weeks later... She died on the 6th of December, 1956. Yeah, and um, it was, I think, it, obviously she was not in the best of health, um, and she probably wouldn't have lived to a ripe old age, but I do believe there was a direct connection, and everyone who knows her, her family, believe there's a direct connection between the injury she received in Nottingham in November and her death in December. At the age of 59. Now... I'm not a doctor, but that cause of death sounds a little bit insane, and the non-nutcase community seem to agree. Well, of course, all the sceptics agree, don't they? I mean, we watch my sceptic video. I mean, I've, I've completely um, analysed their entire movement. Of course they all agree. It's like a cult, isn't it? Now, maybe she did actually sustain some kind of injury from snorting the cheesecloth back up <laughs> far too fast. Well, can you imagine the mechanics of this? He, he seriously, I know skeptics do suggest this. Dank is not the only one, but it's, it's, it's. This is the equivalent of the the joyriding ice cream van or the levitating lighthouse at Rendlesham Forest. You know you're onto a good case when the skeptic explanations are crazier than anything we woo woos could ever come up with. Or maybe she already had an existing stomach problem. But the general consensus was that Helen was just really unhealthy. She was actually so fat that she couldn't function properly. Oh, she, oh, there's no need to put it like that. But yes, yeah, she was overweight and she was in bad health, yes. So was Elvis Presley, but no one has a go in for that. Uh, but the, the, you see, there is still, I, I believe, from, from what I've heard from, from family and friends and people like that, and from Maggie and her family, I met them all that there was like a reunion in, in Derby, I think it was, if, you, if I remember, where I spoke, actually. Um... That there was a direct connection between the injury she received in Nottingham and her death a few five weeks later. To the point where <coughs> even just moving around wasn't really a strong suit. So yeah, it turned out that Helen wasn't really a medium, but an extra large. Oh, I'm sure someone else has come up with that joke. Dankula. Even though Helen was nothing more than a shameless hack, her public persona ended up doing a lot for the spiritualist movement. But, as we just discussed, that movement was purely metaphorical. As a result of the trial, the Witchcraft Act was repealed in 1951, and it was replaced with the Fraudulent Mediums Act. Yes. Three years later, spiritualism as a whole was officially recognised as a real religion. And the absolute state of women has never been the same again. <laughs> he's get, he's channeling his inner Sargon now. But, you know, um, it's true. <clears throat> funnily enough, though, the Fraudulent Mediums Act was not repealed until 2008. It's not been replaced by anything since then, luckily. To this day, these dipshits <coughs> are doing their bit to give back to their brave leader who sacrificed her freedom and reputation for them. They are fighting in Helen's... No, oh, oh, very funny. It's It's actually not... She didn't sacrifice. It was not a sacrifice. It was a. It was a. It was a gross. It was a gross injustice and unfairness. The unfair prosecution of a, a woman who really shouldn't have been prosecuted, and she should have been. She should not have been treated like that. She was mistreated badly, and um, it's the reason I'm so interested in this. I think is partly because it's similar to my situation at the hospital in t in 2012. It's very very similar to that corner and campaigning for the pardon these by the way are, this is another joke of dankulas these are not spiritualists guys spiritualists don't dress like merlin of helen and all other mediums like her that they believe were wrongfully convicted under the witchcraft act due to misogynistic persecution it wasn't misogyny the idea of misogyny didn't exist in those days but yeah they were they were persecuted as for being mediums, yeah. Some of them were men. I mean, there was a minority of mediums were men. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, it, <clears throat> it was a, a gross injustice, yes. 
And it's going about as well as you would expect. Um, Petitions to posthumously pardon... Uh, no, no, it's not. It's out, well, I've given an update, haven't I, if you remember my recent talks? Golden Helen have failed as recently as 2008 and 2012. What about after that? I'll come to that in a minute. With a Holyrood Petitions Committee member saying, I feel we've got better things to talk about. <laughs> and... It's an interesting lesson in history, but it has no purpose whatsoever, and I would like to close it now. I'm honestly, I'm honestly quite surprised that the Scottish government didn't bend over backwards to accommodate these idiots for victim points. Well, just wait till wait, wait and see what happens later. I think um, Dank has obviously not read the most recent news, which I will enlighten you and hopefully he as well, if he's watching, with in a moment. But it's not just Helen's rabid supporters that are keeping her legacy going. We can't even get rid of the woman herself. A number of mediums have claimed to have communed with Helen yeah. from the other side. But she regularly communicates, Helen does. Because, of course, they fucking have. Her own daughter even allegedly had a chat with her in the 80s. That's true. I met, I met, um, I met, I didn't, I didn't actually meet Helen's daughter, but I met her, I met her grandparents and I met her, her great her great nieces and nephews and her granddaughter. And her grandchildren eagerly inherited the grift and are still trying to clear Helen's name. When Maggie is not a grifter. Maggie is a good lady. She's a decent lady and I'm, I'm very fond of her. She's a very, very close friend and I support her 100% and she's doing a good thing. And I'll explain exactly why in a minute. While insisting that <coughs> Helen's gift was real. Look, we can debate where we go after we die until the cows come home. Maybe there's something, maybe there isn't. But one thing that the vast majority... That's interesting. So Dan Dankula does have an... He does have an open mind when it comes to the possibility of an afterlife. This puts him at odds with most sceptics. It's interesting he says this. I wish he'd gone into more detail on this particular idea about... What, what is it we have to debate until the cows come home, Dank? So I'd love to hear you say more about that. What majority of us can all agree on is there is no communing with the dead. We don't all agree on that, and I don't. That's it. The end. Your ticket's punched. Press F. Do not pass go. That's all, folks. Goodbye. Well, it is. It's true that death is, to quote Shakespeare, the undiscovered country from which no traveller ever returns. That is true. However, you, even though you don't return, you can still send a message back. When we enter the halls of Mandos, we are not coming back. Hmm. Of course, not coming back, but it's communication. Some people did come back from the halls of Mandos. That's a bad example. But it is a... That's probably some, that's some geeky, nerdy kind of comic book thing, isn't it, Dank? Bad fact of life, and I know how hard it is to come to terms with in the moment, but we can't move on with our lives and our grief until we do. You may not, he may not be familiar with continuing bonds. I've mentioned this before. It's, it's a form of bereavement counselling pioneered, I think, by Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, where you do actually continue your relationship with the person who's deceased in, in several different ways. Um, you're just encouraged to talk to them and things like that and, and, and communicate with them, even if you don't actually believe real communication is possible. It's, it's, a, it's a long, complicated story. I don't have time to talk about it here. But one of the a very interesting article of Nexus, Nexus magazine, which you know I regularly read, had a, they had a, um, they had a, a, lo a long kind of article about continuing bonds and about the success it has as a close to the closure method, which is the more traditional form of bereavement counselling. And all <coughs> Helen ever did was completely wreck the grieving process of her victims, not clients, victims. No, unfair. By selling them false hope in the form of spiritual snake oil, and even worse, literally puppeteering the dead for profit. This is just, that's a standard sceptic um, line, that is. And it's unfair, and it's uns it's insulting. And the only reason, I'm le as I said, I'm letting Dankoff lightly here, because I know he's a comedian, and you don't always know when he's being serious or not. And um, so it could be this is a part of his joke. I don't know. All of the idiots that are into <coughs> all of this pretentious New Age voodoo nonsense... Because it's not voodoo and it's not New Age. New Age actually began with Alice Bailey. It, it, there was New Age kind of like theosophy and things like that at the time Helen was practising. And also anthroposophy from what's his name, Rudolf Steiner and people like that. But it was very different, for example, the 
the post 1950s new age with the, the hippies and things findhorn community which i talked about and i said before it's not voodoo voodoo is something entirely different voodoo is a syncretic shamanic religion which originates in africa and was practiced it cannot be found really having any influence outside of haiti its homeland and parts of the united states especially louisiana um so there because <laughs> they're so nihilistic that they want their own immortal souls sold back to them as products that they can vapidly consume because they think they're too good for real religion they just love the fact that helen was so hard done by again that's that is a real that's a dis from that's a dysphemism it's a it's a very derogatory assumption you're making about people here dank I for simply helping people connect with their loved ones yeah that's what she was doing but i think she wasn't treated harshly enough Fuck her. Fuck Helen Duncan. Mediums literally prey on people's grief. So what would you do? How, how long would you think she should be in jail for then? Nine years? Nineteen years? She was a soulless <laughs> grifter that preyed on heartbroken people who were at their most vulnerable. Well, now we know that you know, afterlife communication is possible because right now, Dankula is channeling Chief Constable Arthur West. He's almost repeating verbatim his uh, character assessment he made a character statement during the sentencing process uh, for helen and he said almost those exact words sure it's easy to clown on our victims for believing in such nonsense in the first place but when you are that distraught you will take any helping hand that comes your way even if that helping hand is made of rubber and wrapped in cheesecloth and dangling out of a dumb bitch's mouth seriously how the fuck did this fool anyone how the fuck do you think this someone could even do that think of think about the logistics of it again i'll, I'll come back to the point i made later she's gonna go she use her tongue to like suck it back in what's she do i get that national security <laughs> is important and d-day was kind of a big deal but the navy were so ridiculously paranoid and overzealous in going after helen duncan that they accidentally made her a martyr when her memory being co-signed to oblivion they probably knew she would become one and regardless they didn't care is the least that she deserved and despite decades of hysteria, I think that Harry Price hit the nail right on the head at the beginning of the entire ordeal. He, he released a fake report. When he said, Could anything be more infantile than a group of grown-up men wasting time, money and energy on the antics of a fat female crook? Well, see, the fact that Price had to get so personal and horrible, it just it says it all, doesn't it? <laughs> I don't know, that was funny that I've seen that scene with, with Alex Jones, yeah, definitely. Hmm. Um now what's happened is Maggie, uh, if you if you listen to my interviews with her and um, you've seen my updates, especially the, I, I would I would recommend definitely in the, for the purposes of the update, watching my my lecture that I did at Rawcon back in 2020 just before the lockdown it's 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 the short version of my helen duncan talk but it does bring up the fact that at least in scotland she could well get a pardon because um holly rood under sturgeon who's now gone did actually release um not only um not only compensation for people prosecuted under the la bruchere amendment of the sodomy laws which is a which was a big issue in scotland what basically means being homosexual uh, but she also she she also issued an official apology and pardon to every single person who was prosecuted under those laws, and indeed this has spread to England as well. And there has been an official apology and pardon for Alan Turing, a man in, who in 1952 was jailed. Well, no, he sorry, he wasn't jailed. He was threatened with jail. I mean, it's a, it's a horrible story what they did to Turing, and I, I talk about it in detail in in this lecture. But um, this guy who should have been the greatest war hero who broke the enigma code was was mistreated so badly he ended up he ended up taking his own life there's been a, there's been an apology and part so it's not just the repeal of the law because the bruchere was repealed in 1967 but the government has issued a full apology and pardon for alan turing simply for as i said for being homosexual now what goes for the bruchere mentions also could go for this because it's a, it's an identical legal situation Helen Duncan was prosecuted under the Witchcraft Act of 1735, which was repealed, 1951. 
if the government on on both sides of the border have said if you are convicted under a, a, a law which is then repealed you can get both an apology and a pardon because the two are very different legally uh not and so not just a, so you then um you can then say, well, what about what about Helen Duncan, who was prosecuted under this other law? Can she get an apology and a pardon too? And legally, because there's now this common law precedent with Alan Turing, and indeed all these people in in Scotland who were treated um, who were treated uh, unjustly, I would say, under the Le Bruchere Amendment, and it's in England too, like Turing. You uh, you could get a pardon. You, 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 you if they can get a pardon, so can Helen. Basically, that's the thing. So. Dankila, again, is wrong. Dankila hasn't caught up with the latest news on this. And uh, Maggie is still very much pursuing this matter, along with other people. So the, the campaign, this long campaign to pardon Helen, which is now very, it's, it's really, really um, old now, could soon reach its goal. So I hope you found that interesting. I mean, there's literally, uh, for those waiting, the, I was going to do a live stream tomorrow. Um, basically, this took, this sort of like took over that whole situation. I was going to do, a, I'm going to do, the, I'm going to do several live streams. One for the 10th anniversary of the citizen hearing. I'm also doing one, of course, for the Outer Limits anniversary. Um, there's, well, there's something else. I've got to do a comments reply video sometime in the next week. Um, there was something else. There was oh, um, I can't remember what the other thing was. Someone asked me to do a a live stream specifically about the paranormal. I'll, I'll I don't I don't think I could do one just about that one subject, but I bring up the paranormal in most of them anyway. So I'm quite happy to discuss that matter in any live stream. So there's a lot coming up very soon on this channel. Um, so keep your eye on it. But thank you all of you for watching Hapanwo TV. Hospital porters, pride and dignity, stop the new world order.